boys. We have an old friend on the show. Kyle Mills returns. Yes, hey. he does. Yeah. Cheers. Hola. Cheers. Yeah. So for our audience, what Kyle is here. What time is it there? Is it like in the morning? You guys, 10 a.m. for me. You're already, you're already <laughs> getting into it? That's why I'm drinking lemonade. You can't, oh, okay. you can't day drink if you don't start early. <laughs> no. I'm going to have another sip now. <laughs> well, Kyle, um, you were... It is, it's been a while, but let's uh, let's start right off by talking about this great book that, that you have out, Enemy of the yeah. Gates. Can you let our audience know what horrors you've cooked up for Mitch um, in a spoiler-free preview? <laughs> yeah, this is a lot. A lot of this has to do with uh, Mitch finally working for a president who doesn't like him because he's always had these presidents who really admired him or sometimes in, in one instance owed him, you know, and... Uh, now he has this president who really dislikes him, dislikes Irene Kennedy, you know, sees them as kind of a challenge to his authority. And the, the idea behind this book, oddly, was to do a, three books um, that was an arc kind of about the collapse of American democracy. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I abandoned that because of the capital insurrection and because of all the you know, the talk of, uh, of stolen elections and all that, it seemed like it was cutting a little close to reality and to home yeah. to the point where, I mean, you know, you want to be realistic and you want to <laughs> talk about what's happening, but you can go overboard and don't people look at it. press anybody. I, yeah, I don't want to read this. <laughs> it's going to start crying. <laughs> so uh, I cut all, I cut like, I don't know, like a lot, like 10, 12 chapters out of the book. Uh, fortunately, it was pretty long. Really? And then kind of distilled it down to, um, you know, kind of this president who's a bit of a malignant character and, you know, very much wrapped up in seeking power and how Mitch was going. Yeah, because it's kind of like you're either with me or you're not. And, you know, Mitch works for the president. So, and so does Irene Kennedy. So it's a little, it sets up this, I don't know, a little bit of soul searching for those two. Of, <clears throat> you know, can you, you know, can you serve your country with, if it's being led by somebody, you know, who's head, taking it in a direction that yeah. you don't want it to go. All right. Well, this novel allows for a rich discussion on so many issues, um, which you blended seamlessly, by the way. Uh, it's hard to know where to start. Um, politicians who put power over countries, you just touched on high level moles, the wealthiest man in the world, life changing technologies. And in the midst of it all, again, as you alluded to, Mitch coming to grips with his changing place in the world. So we know you're not a pantser. Um, so can you describe a little bit about how these diverse elements came together as you constructed the story? Yeah, you know, it's kind of an interest of mine in that uh, there seems to be sort of the rise of a ruling class. Um, you know, they're political and they're wealthy and they're very kind of international. Um, <clears throat> the barriers between countries, I think, feel like for that class of people are breaking down. You know, they're more loyal to each other than they are maybe to their, to their own country. So I wanted to blend all those elements. So yeah, so this has the world's first trillionaire in it. And Mitch ends up working for him, which he doesn't really want to do, but Kennedy wants him to. The guy's under threat, but he's a pretty benevolent guy. He's, I got to the point where he's bored with making money, basically. He's got enough. Yeah. And he wants yeah. to do something interesting with it. A little bit of an Elon Musk yeah. kind of... Uh, you know, Bill Gates sort of guy. So he's putting his money toward uh, kind of helping humanity in the way that he thinks it needs to be helped. But that makes you enemies. You know, if you, yeah. if you, for instance, you know, it's that sort of every action has an opposite, you know, an equal and opposite of reaction. If you come up with an amazing medical, uh, you know, breakthrough, well, you're going to make pharmaceutical companies unhappy, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, you could come with huge breakthrough in, you know, in wind and or solar, then, you know, the Middle East is going to be unhappy and the <laughs> oil industry is going to be unhappy. So there are a lot of powerful forces in kind of push pulling in the world right now. And a lot of technology kind of running rampant, it's sort of out of control. Like the technology changes so quickly. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of bring all that together in a book. Yeah. Well, we just alluded to the, uh, that, 
Mitch and Kennedy are in a much different position with this new president than they had in previous administrations and obviously previous books of yours. And they both seem to be questioning their careers and the costs that they've endured to fight the good fights. Um, and Mitch is really battling uh, himself as it relates to his future and his commitment to the government overall. Do you see that as a possible natural progression in the change of administrations and the good and bad of that? Or is there also another element of them getting a little older, or maybe a little more reluctant at this point in their lives to continue dealing with the endless BS that comes from all that? I think there's a point maybe, and maybe I'm reaching it a little bit. It's hard to keep yourself <laughs> out of these, out of your books where you think, haven't I seen this before? Yeah. You know, like, wasn't I alive during Vietnam? And it started, it's starting to all replay, yeah. in, you know, in my life. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're 50 year cycles. Right. Is that what we do? We just repeat everything every 50 years. It seems like and it. so, yeah. And yeah, so exactly. Mitch is thinking these things. He's like, wait a minute. Didn't I just sort of destroy those people? And <laughs> now they're back behind, and it's a different name or yeah. whatever. And what have I done with my life kind right. of thing? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just old, older and wiser. I mean, you, Mitch has evolved, you know, Vince did it so skillfully. <clears throat> you can't have that same character for 20 odd books, right? You right. Know, Mitch started when he was in college and now he's older and the world has changed massively since that would have been 1984. And, you know, he's got to come to grips with it. And I think that's what makes these things fun the character feels real and you never know where they're going to go yeah i just can't get over the fact that he wanted he thinks he could ride get on his his bike at his age <laughs> and do that that trek that 300 odd mile whatever that's that kyle is. that's like, just kyle i'm just gonna train for a little bit and just do it <laughs> i'm like i'm like kyle's a badass oh wait mitch is a badass <laughs> yeah i that one I had a friend that wanted me to do that with him. And I thought, geez, I do, you know, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I want to go that far. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Mitch is, you know, his history is being a, you know, yeah. a pro triathlete. So I don't think that'd be too heavy a lift. Wouldn't it be more of a criterium guy being kind of a badass <laughs> seal? <laughs> yeah, it could be. That I mean, I be. They, they crash so bad. That I know. <laughs> I've got a lot of free teeth in my mouth from all those. Yeah. Well, well, Africa, it's a, it, it, as a setting plays a central role uh, in enemy at the gates and Mitch is setting up a somewhat normal life granted it's inside of a like a compound in South Africa but he's also a short hop away from all the action in Uganda where a lot of the story takes place what drew you in this book specifically to Africa I mean even Mitch Rapp comments he spent most of his career killing terrorists in the Middle East that's like his bread and butter right so why right. this halfway pivot <clears throat> to Africa is it the does it has to do with something that Africa is potentially a flashpoint in your mind for the superpowers and all the like the minerals and rare earth stuff that's there? Yeah, in many ways. So also, so Claudia, he set Claudia up there uh, years, it would have been, I guess, years ago that um, to get her out of the way to change her name so her, her enemies couldn't come after her. And he felt like that was an out of the way place. So kind of outside of Cape Town. I lived there for quite a while. So it's familiar to me. And like we were just earlier talking about, it was hard to get out during COVID and mm. research new locations. So that's a place that's in my head. Uh, so I, and she has a house there. She is, they, you know, she lives there part time. So I thought, well, he'll just go back there with her. And then, yeah, Africa is an interesting place if you're talking again about, you know, the, the sort of connection between wealth and power, because wealth can get you a lot of power in, uh, in Africa. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you know, it's really rural. You can get away from people. You can make deals with governments. And with a trillion dollars, that can go a long way. So I thought it'd be interesting to, you know, kind of have this trillionaire who's struggling a little bit with his own power. And Mitch at one point kind of basically says, well, <clears throat> you know, if you're having a lot of trouble here, I can get some guys together and just have Uganda. You know, we'll just take it. <laughs> and uh, he's saying, well, no, 
And, you know, Mitch's argument is what, why? Because the leader of Uganda is so legitimate. He just yeah. killed a bunch of people to get his place. So you can, let's kill a bunch of people and you can have his chair. There's no, like, what's the difference between a government and a wealthy person? This goes back to the feudal times, you know? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, it was whoever had the bigger army all of a sudden got to sit in the castle and, you know, got the queen or whatever. Right. And, so what's right and wrong and all this stuff, which are kind of interesting things to explore now as things are so crazy. Yeah, Mitch, Mitch probes, him, probes him about that. It's always like pushing yeah. that a little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, what are you willing to do, right? You want to save the world? I mean, in Mitch's idea, and I think he says this in the book, you know, the world doesn't want to be saved. So yeah. if you want to save it, you're going to have to push. And are you prepared to do what it takes because I'm the guy that was, uh, everybody says, well, you go, you know, do what it takes, but I don't want to get dirty here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I thought that was an interesting conversation between those two. Yeah. Well, building off Chris's question about change of setting, and, and I guess I must have drawn the process straw here because all my questions <laughs> seem to be about your process. Um, <laughs> You face the challenge each time out that I think few authors face. Um, you know, only only a handful of series reach the length that you're you're dealing with. Um, I always finish one of your books and think, well, Mitch has seen it and done it all. I mean, I, what the hell else can he do? And yet, <clears throat> the next time out, you always surprise me by covering new ground, whether it's geopolitically, geographically, mm -hmm. but most importantly, character wise, by showing a new facet of Mitch or one of the key supporting characters that we've come to know so well. When does the vision for the next book typically take take shape in your mind? Is it while you're finishing the prior book or do you have to kind of get away, read the land and then let it all coalesce before you begin outlining again? Typically the latter. I would, uh, you know, finish the book and kind of clear my mind, see what's going on in the world at that point. Because, you know, as you guys know, it takes forever to write a book and it's going to be published and all that. So in that time, now things really have changed you know it's not a static world by any means anymore um so typically that would be the case the next book after this one though is very much a continuation of this book so similar to what vince had done in the past and that i've never done which you know you have some books of Vince's but it's kind of a little hard to tell where one ends yeah. and the next one yeah. starts right right and I've taken that one step further in that <clears throat> basically the last chapter of this book is the first chapter of the next book but I rewrote it to be from Mitch's point of view instead of the point of view character huh. uh, in the enemy at the gate so you get to see the same scene more or less but from what is he thinking about it? Um, awesome. And then cool. it kicks off just so right from there. So the difference between those two books is five minutes in Mitch time, right? Right. Oh, me likey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was interesting because I couldn't figure out if I wanted to do that or not. Because there's even things that they talk about doing, I think, I don't, it's not much of a spoiler, but they talk about getting stuck in the mud in this, in this chapter and I'm going to winch themselves out. So it kind of like starts with showing that they're, they're winching themselves out of the yeah, mud. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's a short mention. And then that, everything yeah. else, all the conversations are exactly the same. All the words are the same, except you get Mitch's impression of what's being said as opposed to the other character. Yeah. I won't give away who it is. Uh -huh. awesome. Dude, that's super cool. Oh, I like, I like that. Really. Hey, um, Irene Kennedy, uh, she takes a phone call from Mitch in a phone booth at one point in the book. And she uses the, a device that defeats eavesdropping, but also simulates a familiar buzzing action well-known throughout the U.S., uh, maybe a mechanical toy type thing. That Care to elaborate on how you came up with that piece of technology? <laughs> I had seen something or read a, an article about that sort of passive listening devices. So you put a laser, as I recall, it was a laser, um, I haven't done this research in a while, on a window. And so the person's talking and it's vibrating the window and they can sure. pick that up, you know, as, as uh, sound. So I thought, well, you would need to do something to this window to obscure that. 
and you can't mm-hmm. like in a phone booth you can't play loud music or anything like that so yeah. i thought you know somebody at the cia had thought oh, you know you could use a sex toy that has a suction <laughs> cup on it and then if and then it'd be perfect because like you could just go through airport security or get caught by the Russians and just be like, well, gee, it's a little embarrassing, but it doesn't look like any kind of an espionage device. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, Irene Kennedy would totally use that. Uh, well, this is a serious we, podcast. That, that was, that was, that was <laughs> pretty Are we going to see Mitch Rapp brand um, uh, accessories? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. I'm going to run that by the family. There's money, there's money there. <clears throat> Might be some money. I'm guessing there's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Let's, so let's get off of the fun one here. So you do use some pretty nifty agent technology, secret agent type stuff that could be real, right? Or do you mostly have this section of your brain that's kind of the make-believe section where you come up with your own tech to, to utilize um, in the stories? So uh, do you have sources out there that kind of say, yeah, maybe we're kind of working on it, but I won't mention it. Or are you just saying, yeah, this would be kind of cool. And you kind of make it up as you go. Well, some of that's real. Um, the DARPA thing is real. Uh, and then the, tra- the sometimes it's funny. I think I'm really clever and I make up these great technologies and then I start researching, find out somebody already invented them <laughs> and that they, they're either in product, you know, they're either under research or something like that. And honestly, the thing I was doing with the burner phones, I worked really hard on that and discovered that there were people that were also working on it in the real world. So mm-hmm. uh, that would kind of work if you could get the data and, you know, not to spoil, have any spoilers, but, you know, they, they have special sort of special access to international data. Um, it's all about data. Without the CIA though, too, because again, you know, the, the thing that makes Mitch grow and it's fun is throwing new things at him. And so now he doesn't really have the backup of the CIA. He can't just make a phone call to the right. tech support say or whatever and get them to deal with it he has to be a little more creative and do it on his own yeah well uh speaking of gadgets and technology while while you put mint rap in saudi arabia he has to contend with the all seeing surveillance state in that country and there i mean there's cameras everywhere and they're at the airport they're at the hot they're on the highways they're in the private neighborhoods and you make note in enemy at the gates that vehicle surveillance has quickly become a thing of the past because of drones and those cameras and stuff but what do you think with the advancement of facial recognition, the miniaturization of drones, tracking devices, what's the world going to look like in 15 years? And is Mitch Rapp, you know, is he going to be able to even do his job? Yeah. I, it's incredible. And it's really sinister. You yeah. Know, I mean, the, the, I mean, certainly the a certain level of tracking is maybe beneficial to people. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to use the map on your phone and stuff sure. like that, but yeah, it's getting to the point. I'm certainly in China. A lot of this was also patterned after Chinese technology where they know everywhere you go. They know everywhere you've been. They can use AI to assign you know, you a value as a human being and a citizen. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it's kind of incredible. And, you know, this you wouldn't you wouldn't think the fake show recognition would be that good. That You know, sunglasses and a beard and all this stuff could defeat it. But it really doesn't no, even right. now. And that's. And 10 years from now, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to do anything. Do you think so that's going to encroach? Do you think it'll encroach on the, like the United, I know some of the authoritative governments are doing it and, and embracing it. Do you think that's going to be the United States? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think, yep. yeah, I mean, I, I think that we are electing such like I don't know, horrible people. Is that not even the right word? It's twisted people who are um, really just obsessed with power and we're letting them do basically anything they want. And and I think that's going to go wrong for the American people. I think we all think it's going right for us, right? Because we say, well, I'm a Democrat, so I'll give them that power. I'm a Republican and I'm going to give them that power, but it doesn't matter. They're just two sides of the same coin, Mm -hmm. you know, and but I think it's definitely going that way and that it's going to become easier and easier and that the American people are not pushing back really against it. It becomes everything in the United States becomes a, 
you know, battle of, you know, just like scoring partisan points. So, you know, if a Republican puts up AI cameras, the Democrats are going to flip out. If the Democrats do it, the the Republicans will flip out. Everybody points, you know, fingers at each other and nobody ever is held accountable. And uh, the Americans need to, the American people need to wake up before it's too late. <laughs> but they're not going to, so bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so i'm gonna have a drink then thanks yeah so, yeah so i'm sticking out see this is why i didn't write that that book see it's depressing <laughs> isn't it? i wrote a drink even more <laughs> it gives us a little more insight into why you're in spain more um, <laughs> well again another process question um you talked a little bit about darpa do you spend more time researching the future of say security and warfare and things you can glean about organizations like DARPA and other tech and weapon development, or do you spend more of your research time sort of reading the tea leaves of geopolitical movement and kind of the future trends in that realm? Definitely the latter, because the latter is where you get the idea for the book. Yeah. And the technology you can think, well, this is what I need here. Does it exist or would it be plausible that it exists? And to me, that's backfill. And then you can call people who are experts in that. But it's hard unless you have a specific, you can't call somebody, you know, who's an expert in, I don't know, geopolitics or economics and say, well, what's going to happen that would be interesting? You know, I mean, it's too open a question, but you can, uh, it, you, so you have to kind of come up with that yourself by reading really widely and thinking about things. The, the other stuff that you can say, well, I really need a, a gun that'll do this or this, and then yeah. some experts going to be able to help you out and tell you what you need. Yeah. Or stun gun that, that a stun gun that shoots out in different directions. Yeah. <laughs> that one I just stumbled across an article about that one, and I thought, oh man, Mitch has to use that. That was pretty cool. <laughs> let, me, let me throw a quick follow up on that. Um, because it's very difficult to vet news sources in this day and age, in my opinion. Um, because I, I something you think is dependable suddenly is not dependable. Um, do you have sort of a go to couple of publications or or things that you you use for your information um yeah do i have a you know i do things really widely because so i listen to a lot of european uh russian um i yeah, i watch russian television like it's kind of propaganda but um i want you know the, the u.s stuff for weird like weird perspective on things i really like a guy named farid zakaria Mm -hmm. um he's given me a lot of ideas about things that everybody thinks are conventional wisdom and he disagrees with um but you know the thing is with the with that side i'm not necessarily looking for accuracy which is sort of right. like i why well, like russian <laughs> news i'm looking for conspiracy theories right. yeah. you're looking for that spark yeah yeah that are plausible you know and the russians love the conspiracy like they think everything you know the americans are you know, controlling everything, pulling every string. So it's it's good fodder for that kind of stuff. You know, well, Chinese television, same way. So I I read pretty widely, but I wouldn't necessarily say all this stuff. I I don't necessarily vet it that kind of stuff for accuracy um, because what I want is a good story. Really. If you're looking for good conspiracy theories, I'll give you my sister's number when we get off, and you can um, she can help you. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, God, they really abound. Like the internet, who knew that would turn from cats and porn to like all conspiracy all the time? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> it's like endless. Yeah. There's still cats and porn, though. Well, <laughs> thank God. Yeah. Crystal Hake good with that stuff. Um, so, so as we've kind of alluded to, Nicholas Ward is is your first trillionaire key figure in the book, obviously. An old adage says that all great wealth comes from a great crime. And you've given Ward a healthy conscious and the need to do good, something that Mitch you know, purposely tests as we've talked about. Do you think accumulating that much money could be used in an altruistic way? Or are you skeptical that someone with that much wealth could even be like Ward in the real world? I think they could, because I think what happens is they get bored. You know, mm. you get 
all you, you make a certain amount of money. It just got, uh, you know, like, what, what am I going to do? Buy another 747 and right. it with my face on the side, you know? So I think oh God, um, I would do that. <laughs> well, yeah, but after you did five, you know, it, For you, every, every day of the week. Yeah. Um, so then yeah, I do different body know, parts. Yeah. Well, don't get him down. That's yeah, where that's, I that's that's start. But. <clears throat> So, yeah, I, but I think it's harder to help people than you think it is, you know, sort of, I mean, the perfect example to be, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and just be super controversial here, not even know how you guys feel about this, but, you know, you can have a global pandemic, create a really good vaccine and think, hey, I've really helped everybody. And it doesn't really turn out that way. Right. So. Um, even if you don't believe in the vaccines or whatever, you, you know, I mean, it was meant to be a help. So um, I think that you have to be careful about how you go about that because people will turn on you. Uh, they, the people that you're trying to help will turn on you. And, and the other side is sometimes you think you're helping. When I lived in Africa, I saw a lot of this. People think they're helping, but they're not. They're making the situation worse because yeah. they don't understand it. I mean, Afghanistan and other purposes. You know, good example of that. Right. War is a disruptive force on an individual and a global level. And whether he knows it or not, he's in the midst of a Game of Thrones. His technological advances tend to change the world, but also pretty much destroy fossil fuels in the Middle East, only leverage uh, on the world stage. Uh, right. And that storyline is pretty rooted in reality. And I wonder if you thought that scenario all the way through, like what happens to the Middle East and Russia, for that matter, when the world no longer relies on fossil fuels. What do you think? I, you know, my, my sense is like with the Middle East, I've always said that it just becomes kind of Africa, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, that it's not, right. it, it's not a big player on the world stage. People don't think about it too much. You know, they do their thing, they are not, and we do our thing, and, and it, it just becomes much less important. Russia, you know, another perfect example. Russia, I'm no big, fan, I'm not a big fan of Russia. So if you guys are fans, sorry, but the, they don't do anything. You know, they're essentially they're like the vandals of the world, right? They they go and screw stuff up. You know, they paint yeah. they paint graffiti on your country and then sneak off to no end. Like they didn't help themselves really. They're just dicks. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, at least the Chinese are pursuing world domination. They're going. <laughs> Russians just, like in your window with a BB gun. Dude, I so love that just, Russians are just going around and spray painting your graffiti, your country. I think uh, both Yuri and Dmitry yeah. have just unsubscribed. Son of a. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry to all my Russian fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your former Russian your book. Yeah. Well, you, you kind of confirmed this earlier, but for me, Enemy at the Gates was kind of a, a high-speed meditation on the nature and use of power. Um, I thought of all the ways power is used and misused in the book and in the real world. Um, there've always been, there's always been those in pursuit of power from the beginning of time, as soon as humans were, you know, Cain and Abel, whatever. But it seems like there's less disapproval by society of the naked pursuit of it in the world we're living in right now. And the polarization, as you mentioned earlier, adds to the people justifying seemingly horrible actions because the people are on their side while demonizing every action by the other side. So with that backdrop, do you find it more challenging to create fictional bogeymen that rival the real ones that we see on television and social media every day? <laughs> yes. Oh my God, yes. I mean, <laughs> they're so, some of these people are so bad and yet they're really popular. And to top them is becoming really difficult. Hmm. And also it's hard to use even like kind of themes of values mm -hmm. because they change really quickly. It's becoming so tribal. You can't say, well, this is, if you want to appeal to conservatives, say, well, this is a conservative value. So I'm going to harp on that. Or if you want to Democrats, maybe a liberal value, I'm going to harp on that because they just sort of, ebb and flow to some extent depending mm -hmm. on what the person in charge says you're supposed to believe and so 
it has become a little bit of a challenge to, for instance, to create a really bad politician. I mean, if you look back at Vince's stuff, these bad politicians that he wrote about, I'd vote for them now. <laughs> you know, he killed a couple of guys. He's kind of a tool. It's not but, bad. You know, he's not that bad. <laughs> We've know? seen worse. And I, yeah, and I start to think, so you have this thing, and it kind of comes up. I don't explore it too much, but in Mitch's mind and Irene's mind, it comes up and I don't really write it down too much, but they killed Christine Barnett well, they didn't kill her, but they suggested yeah. that she yeah. suicide, right? For all of these crimes, and they were gonna bring her up on these crimes and all this stuff. Right. And now I can't help they're sitting they're sitting there thinking, she wasn't that bad. I mean, she <laughs> tried to kill us, but you know, um, now that they have cook in office. So yeah, you know, qualities. <laughs> yeah, you know, you say you think, you know, you take out in the Middle East, you know, you take out one leader and you just be very careful that there isn't somebody way worse. Yeah. You know, waiting in the wings to yeah. take over. So it is becoming a weird challenge to create villains and good guys because those themes, the things that we thought of as, well, this is what good people do and this is what bad people do, has become very murky. It becomes it's much more about identity than yeah. anything else. Boy, that's so well, true. On, on a, yeah, on a, on a related note, there's a conversation between Rap and uh, Bashir near the end of, of The Enemy at the Gates that stuck in my head long after turning the last page. Bashir asks Rap, if he ever wonders how the world's powerful gain control, that there's something about the masses that attracts us to their insatiable uh, hunger, their ruthless, single-minded drive. And because of that, the world has ended up with Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Pol Pot, Napoleon, and on and on and on. Rap didn't want to get into a philosophical debate in the book, um, but I'm hoping you will. And, uh, and <laughs> why do you Maybe think- Maybe at some point, did... that's, a, that's a conversation for Irene, probably. Yeah. Probably, right? Right, right. But why do you, why do you think, why does Kyle Mills think that humanity gives power and control to precisely the ones who shouldn't have it? <laughs> It's uncanny, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you know, it's almost that some of these people in power, you think they're the exact person that you would never, like, even give the key to your house for, as a house. I mean, you would oh. never give them power over you. Right. And I think we're, I think people are drawn to strength and, um, you know, the uncertainty and, I don't know. You know, it's funny uh, to, to, to be even more depressing. If you ever want to understand people study chimps and the way they set up their hierarchy, you know, we're, we're just kind of chimps that got a little smarter, but you know, you've got the really powerful mean spirited, like kill you in a second chimp kind of running things and he's got his little oligarchy of power, mm. other strong chimps, but not quite as strong as him. And yeah. they're looking to take him down yeah. and when he gets a little weak, they're going to gang, you know, make a you know, gang up and, and you just think, oh my God, this is politics. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just put a D and an R on a couple of those guys and let them go at it. The trees and throw feces at each other and put it on the news. And, and there it is. That's uh, pick a side. Yeah. That's the six o'clock news. <laughs> yeah. That's the best exactly. I've ever heard. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I'd say, but, but you know, again, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get too depressing here, which is why I took all a lot of that stuff out of the book. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we just kill people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, at least in fiction, you can kind of bring the justice that doesn't always come in the real world. That's the right. Great, uh, yeah. Well, Kyle, um, unbelievably, you've survived another uh, main portion of an interview, which is. Uh, <sighs> So it's, it's rare. Lucky, it's lucky three bastard here. Yeah. Is, is he a three a red button just in case? I need to pretend, <laughs> uh, Bad connection here. Bad connection. <laughs> we will send you the special uh, three. Uh, we get we do this really jeweled ring for everybody. It's a three timer, so you'll get yeah, it. I'm sure it'll make it to Spain. Just, it won't be just, repeat. just don't wear it in the sun. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> it melts. But so that be, that means worth the lightning round. So um, uh, I'm empty, but the guys, can you toast him for the lightning round? Yeah, of yeah. course we can. Oh, yeah, 
I don't want to drink out of the bottle. It'll be unbecoming of me. Um, it's normal, but not becoming. I'm going to test. You're in Spain, and I'm going to test. How, how good is your Spanish? Do you think it's pretty good? Uh, it's not as good as I wish, but okay. I, I, I can give it a shot. Right. Mine's non-existent. Um, I'm, I okay. it. um, it's better than that. My German is non-existent <laughs> as well. But I'm going to give you two phrases, and I want you to tell me what they mean. But apparently, okay. these are like indispensable phrases in Spain, according to- In Spain, hopefully not in Latin America. According to the very, no, in Spain, and according to the very accurate internet. <laughs> the first one, and I will butcher this, I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Oh, here it comes. El Vagre. It's, could you repeat that? You cut out. Sure. Me pica el Vagre. Uh, something like stings or itches, but- Oh, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the catfish. The catfish is biting me. <laughs> which ah, I did which not hear the word for catfish. Which apparently, well, <laughs> apparently means um, you're hungry as a horse. Essentially, it's the same as us saying you're hungry as a horse. Oh, I was gonna say, how is that important? Yeah. Like El Gato, right? No. <laughs> this one's a lot no. longer, so I'll even butcher this for, further. Oh, jeez, um, nice. No saber, ni papa de algo. No saber de pop wait, ni him. No, no, I'm sorry. No saber, no saber ni papa de algo. Ni papa de algo. Yes. That part I think I got right. I don't uh, it's spelled like the I don't word. I don't like it's like I don't know either neither my father or anything else. Yeah. It's okay, what it it's, means literally, but I guess this is a mode. <laughs> Like a modismo, like a saying. Yeah. What it says is no, not knowing a potato about something. Potato? No. Oh, so okay. Really? Which Papa apparently also means, would be potato. Which yeah. apparently means mm -hmm. I have no Papa clue. Fritos. Apparently, yeah. it's a way of saying no I have no clue. So, God, I've never heard that one either. According to the internet, those two and and all my uh, Spanish-speaking friends, I apologize for the butchering of pronunciation. <laughs> Horrible I've never heard either one so of those. We're, we're losing Russian viewers, and now we're losing our Spanish awesome. viewers. Awesome. Good job, Sean. Thanks. <laughs> you, you're gonna have to ask people about those phrases now. See if you can find oh, some well, again. there are so many weird phrases throughout the Spanish-speaking world, and nobody understands each other's. Okay. So, uh, but no, I'm not, I hadn't heard either one of those. Those are good. <laughs> I have to remember. Oh, my last question: Who or what yeah. is Rantoncito Perez? Ratoncito Perez. I could spell the first word as capital R A T O N. Yeah, no, I know, I know what it means. It's like a, it would be like a kind of a small rat. Uh, Perez. No, I don't know. Apparently, <laughs> there's no tooth fairy in Spain. It's a tooth mouse, and that is his name. <laughs> oh, really? And that is his name. So if well, having no children, I that one does not come out. <laughs> Ratoncito Perez. You have to pay so, the tooth so mouse brings you money. <laughs> So, yeah, guy, you're teaching me everything about this Spanish <laughs> culture now. If I find a shirt that says that has Rancho Perez, I would be very. I don't know. As, as a child, yeah. I think it'd be okay with a fairy like flying in, like in yeah, the I think a, rat. Like a mouse crawling underneath my pillow, <laughs> yeah. eating your toes. Be, your toes. Weird. <clears throat> no, so, right. geez, I flunked. I flunked Spanish <laughs> culture. Yep, you got to come back to Wyoming. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh. Um, let's see. All right. My round. Um, so Kyle and I are both avid cyclists. Um, and so let's go down that hole mm -hmm. and, and this one's going to be easy. I know you're going to get it. What small, it's city out, out, what small city outside Barcelona is known as a European cycling hotbed? Girona. Girona. My Girona. Yeah. Yeah. Or mine. <laughs> Just spent like three weeks there. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Name the last Spanish rider to win the Tour de France. God, I don't watch bike racing anymore. What? Nah, it's just become such a drug. Yeah, drug I know. I, I, I kind of always was, but it just became more apparent as time went on. <laughs> yeah, it's like guy, they, now they, it's guys are like taking four minutes out of what Lance yeah. Armstrong's best doped, you know, thing yeah, and yeah, not yeah. even opening their mouths. I finally <laughs> gave up on it. The last Spanish writer, I honestly don't know. Alberto Contador. Oh, really? It was that far back? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. All right. Another now, doper. You really? now have to get this one correct or you're going to be kicked out of Spain. 
Ouch. Name the most the, the the most successful Spanish cyclist of all time. I would think Miguel Indurain. That's exactly right. How could he not? He's considered the their, their greatest athlete of all time, actually. Really? Yep. Interesting. Well, he was a good. He was a good great cyclist. cyclist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, won the tour five times. Yeah. All I right. See, Ta-da. I got to see George Bush in uh, when he was president down in Waco cycle with uh lance armstrong oh on the mountain biking yeah on the mountain yeah on his mountain hmm, biking. i'm guessing that, that was, was uh a blowout <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was interesting bush was doping bush was doping, B- bush was doping typically <laughs> bush. Listen, but is bush was... a pretty good i know he's into mountain biking he's, he's active he's... he got, he got into is. mountain biking because uh his knees were hurting to run and he used to always like to go on the runs um and he would try to like outrun the secret service guys who were like on the shift running with them but oh. secret service guys if they did get tired at, at any point they would jump in the follow-up and one other guy or girl would jump <laughs> out and so you always have a fresh body relay so he's never outrunning I anybody i would have assumed they just assigned really good runners well yeah he's the other thing too yeah. top athletes they yeah, do but then exactly. but it was so funny on his ranch down in waco when they would do the bike the bike ride so it'd be it'd be the president lance like three other top riders i i didn't know who they were they'd be riding and then there'd be six or seven agents on bikes and then there'd be atvs and then there would be four suburbans <laughs> and just just it was ridiculous it's not is that a little bit of i mean overkill if you're on his, if he's on his ranch yeah, it seems like that would be overkill yep. yeah well you can get a long range shot out there i'm sure so it was unreal you, yeah, could, you, you would that... just see just they would go and you just, like yeah, they, exactly you, you want know. the perimeter security <laughs> yeah. all right so here are my questions um all right i'm doing terrible so let's yeah see. you're gonna do yeah, worse on this one too this uh, one's a little bit really yeah. uh, for some strange reason because maybe because it was on the television i wrote this question you find yourself in the jungles of uganda on an episode of naked and afraid how many days <laughs> okay. or hours before you tap out or do you make all 21 days Ooh. Could you explain to me what naked and afraid oh is? Oh. <laughs> so it's so two TV idiot show. people, two idiot people, a guy and a, and a, a, a woman decide that they're going to go into the jungles of anywhere or the desert or the or like the C- Caribbean and strip off all their clothes and have no provisions and try to last 21 days. Finding water, food, they're literally shelter. naked and afraid when they go out, they why, can make why, clothes. Uh, my God. Is there a big prize for that? How yeah, no the prize? life. No, a lot of people get like dengue fever, malaria, <laughs> <There's hepatitis. laughs> hypothermia. Right, well, let me just tell you, a friend of mine was doing a an expedition in Borneo, a climbing expedition, expeditions way into the back country, <clears throat> and uh, for the out, it was the Outdoor Channel or something, and he invited me to go on it. And I said, no way in hell. So that I would tap out with no, like no money riding on it. If no. it was a million bucks right now, otherwise it'd be in the air conditioned car. <laughs> like I'd go out there and do that for free. Hell. <laughs> the worst thing about that is, is with like when they're in the jungle or the swamps, like day one, the people are covered in welts because every, all the insects are just every eating animal them alive. insect known to man. Yeah, and, like, and I'm not a big fan of leeches either. <laughs> And I remember all this. I remember asking the trip doctor for this thing that he that uh, that was in Borneo. He's like, "Can you keep anti venting? Because there's a lot of snakes." And he's like, yeah. "Well, we don't have a refrigerator, so not really." But he's like, "I'm pretty sure I could keep you alive. It'd be a you know, be really unpleasant, but I, I think I can." And I thought, <laughs> "I'm no. sticking." Here. He can do anything with the EpiPen. You watch. (laughs) Oh, great. We just want to be like laying in the swamp. I I pictured myself laying in the swamp with one of those big needles in my heart. And I thought, you know, that's my drilling. I'll hike out. And I thought, no, no, no. Not worth it. So you're tapping out before you even get on that. Before I even get out of the car. Smart, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's that would have been my answer, too. So it's one for one. Let's the next one. So Jeopardy is still looking apparently for a host to replace the late Alex, Alex Trebek. Who do you think it should be? Wasn't LeVar Burton up for that? He, well, he was on one why, episode. I don't know why they haven't made him the guy. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So I definitely go anybody from Star Trek, really. 
Me too. Honestly, uh, William Shatner. That's my bet. I'd, I'd say William Shatner. <laughs> That guy's hilarious. Or Sean Connery. Great. I'd love to see him condescend <laughs> to guests when they're wrong. That would be the best. That would actually be pretty hilarious. <laughs> All right, William Shatner. I like that answer. So now you're uh <laughs> see, yeah. send that out on the interwebs and see if oh, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll we'll cut we'll if, pull if this they, clip. If they, yeah. if they, it works. All right, here's the last question. Of the seven now Mitch Rap books you've written, which one do you think has the greatest potential of being seen on the big or small screen? Of the ones I've written? Yeah. yeah. Which one would be? And that's always an interesting question because you have to think, does it have too many characters? Would it be expensive? Too expensive to make? I don't know, maybe Order to Kill because that's pretty drawn in on, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be cheap, pretty cheap to make and it's drawn in on like two characters. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, All right, that's probably. it. Let's make it happen right now. Do it. <laughs> uh, it would be fun, but uh, I, I stay away from Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> well, you've survived now the lightning round three times. So. Nice. Uh, barely. Is, God, I barely. Three for three for three. I'm going to study my Spanish idioms. You, you might be like, a little bloodied after that lightning round, but you yeah, did. Yeah. Geez. Yeah. Cheers, Kyle. Cheers. I'll bring him back for Cheers. next season. Yeah. Kyle. Again, and I, I put this in my question earlier, but it's it's serious. When I finish a book, I'm like, God, what's he going to do next? And every oh. time, I blow my doors off. This is a another hell of a book. Um, to keep to keep that rabid fan base happy for this long is quite yeah. the accomplishment. And uh, we just uh, big fans and Dude, we're gonna love it. Buys this fantastic yeah. story. Bro. We didn't even story. talk about there was so much we could talk we could talk about the drugs that the the Uganda guys were taking like there was yeah. so much to talk about yeah. and some stuff you know the spoiler stuff we don't want to obviously give away but dude it was a fantastic story and I loved it it was yeah. so I mean it's it's Kyle Mills book it's very Vince Flint esque and I loved yeah. it dude you know you're getting oh, right off the bat thank you thank you I, I hope hopefully fans will love it so Hollywood. far the ambassadors have really liked it yeah. so that's usually a pretty decent indicator that uh, people are going to have fun with it. I've seen more than a few of them say it was their favorite um, of your books. So uh, that's sounds like a bodes well. That's good. Yeah. 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 Cause <laughs> you're always afraid after a bunch of books, you know, you're going to start to fade, but um, no. I don't know. I can always find something interest, interesting for Mitch to do. He's a really cool character. Well, you got, it's a five book, five more books to do, right? On this current deal. No. Oh, um, wasn't it? No, two more, two more. I'm two, on, oh, two more. I'm on I'm writing the second of a three book deal. So, yep. Chris, are you announcing something that we need to know? Yes, about? yes. he has another three book deal. <laughs> we the crew reviews has signed Kyle Mills. <laughs> Thank you. Man, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> no, that'd be exciting. Huh? Yeah. Um, He's brief over there in Spain. Our best to no. you, and uh, yeah, you know, anytime you can come back. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. Can't wait to see you again, bud. Yeah. Well, boys, another great conversation with our friend Kyle Mills mm -hmm. about his latest book, Enemy at the Gates. Yeah. Another home run for Kyle and another great conversation. Yep. Every week, it gets better, boys. It does. Thanks to Kyle and to doing this for months on end. We are coming up on season three, people. Cheers. Cheers to that, too. Hmm. This is the outro for Kyle Mills, Sean, sporting that ball state action. Here we go. Balls? Where? Ball state in three, two, and game. <laughs>